Hey, y'all. Welcome to the Ball and Breakfast Podcast. My name is Gio. And finally, we're back. The international break is coming to an end. And that only means that the Ball and Breakfast Podcast is back up and running from our hiatus to follow again the top six teams in the Premier League alongside top six team news in the Premier League, all things Premier League and Champions League. Man, it feels good to be back here with you guys. Going to preview week five of the Barclays Premier League. So much going on. Um, Took a little hiatus because after this international break, obviously, we're going to be jam-packed. We got three games a week for most teams, and it's going to be full throttle. I feel refreshed. I feel ready. I feel amazing. And guys, as I said, we're back. And so we have some stuff to discuss. I'm going to do a preview for the Week 5 Premier League fixtures. So starting off Week 5, we have my team on Saturday. The early game, Wolverhampton Wanderers versus Liverpool. And very interesting game here for Liverpool. No Van Dijk. No reports on Kanate being back for the Wolves game. Joe Gomez and Matip will deputize as we saw against. Who did we play last? We gave them that three love swap in. Aston Villa. Yes, as we saw against Aston Villa, we had Joe Matip, Joe Gomez, Trent at right back, Robo at left back. I may expect the back line to stay the same as the previous fixture. As we probably see the same midfield as the, the last fixture as well with McAllister. I don't know if Klopp's going to interchange the midfield a little bit considering the international break was just recently. Wolverhampton Wanderers losing potentially their best player in Matthias Nunes to Manchester City and he might have Endo starting at the CDM position might give a substitute berth to uh, Ryan Gravenberg who has officially once again signed for Liverpool Football Club one of my top three young favorite midfielders in the world alongside Sandro Tonali but looks like Sandro is going to have a little bit of a warm time under those time sign fans but we'll get to him as well Yes, so I think I expect to see Endo in the CDM position. I expect to see Zabaslai in my midfield. Most likely, most likely, considering the news that we are getting from Uruguay, which is that Darwin Nunes is out, injury, muscular strain. I do expect Diogo Jota to start up front for the Reds. I expect to see probably Cody Gakpo off the left side simply because in terms of game time, Luis Diaz has played 90 minutes, even though Cody Gatpo has played 90 minutes for Netherlands. I still would expect him to be on the left side or somewhere along that attacking three simply because he hasn't logged the type of minutes that Luis Diaz has logged for the start of the season for us. And just in terms of freshness and, again, mitigation against injury. However, with all those changes being said, I do expect Liverpool to come out on top with a whopping 2-1 to one victory against Wolves. Following that, we have Fulham versus Luton, as I said. Guys, for your fantasy Premier League, this is the time. If you have a, if there's a Fulham striker you like, put them in your team because Luton will get a battery. I expect Fulham to drop a handy 3-0 win on Fulham. I expect Bobby Cordoba Reed to score. I expect maybe Harry Wilson to get a, a knock in. Maybe Vinicius um, up at the front. Going forward to Tottenham versus Sheffield. Now, this is this is a little bit of a toss-up. The Blades haven't started the season particularly well. And Tottenham, albeit how they've started well, I just don't think they're defensively sound. And they do let in goals. Mickey Van Den Ven, the shithouse that rejected my club, own goal specialist. I expect him to be shaky all season. I'm going to go with a 
nil all draw for Spurs versus Sheffield. I expect Sheffield to bank bunker in two banks of four, try maybe to hit on a counter attack. Won't be. I think Romero is in good form as much as Mickey Van den Ven is not in good form. And I just expect a position based football, which seems to be um, Big Engie's kind of postcard style of football from Spurs. I do expect them to do much damage, but I do expect Sheffield to get a point out of this away to the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. And then, to me, what I think is going to be one of the highlight fixtures of the season, because there, I believe, it's so much riding on this fixture. Manchester United hosting Brighton. Now, first of all, update, there will be no Evan Ferguson for this game. Out injured. Big loss for Brighton. However, it is possibly the debutant to make an impact. Ansu Fati from Barcelona looking to make a statement whilst at Brighton. Looking at Mitomo off that left side. Looking at Pascal Gross. Looking at a well-organized Roberto De Zerbi squad playing against a massively depleted Manchester United team. Why do I say depleted? <laughs> Look on that back line. No Baran. Harry might come into the fray. No recognized left back. Probably Dalo, predicated on his last performance, will play at left back for Manchester United because he did do well against Arsenal. No Mason Mount. Reportedly, you guys loaned in an injured Amrabat. So he possibly, possibly won't be ready for this game. But on the other hand, I expect a debut start for Asmus Hoyland. So I expect it to be a guns blazing, end to end, wall to wall, balls to wall, back and forth, attacking affair. In which ultimately I think Manchester United will lose. I have Brighton winning that game 3-2. to two. two goals for Matomo. One for Pascal Gross. I expect a, de a, a, a debut start in goal for Rasmus Hoyland. And one for Marcus Rashford. Ultimately, Manchester United lose the game. And it could be a spiraling moment for their season. Ten Hag officially in trouble. Then we go on to a battle of the two, probably outside of Liverpool, probably the two informed teams in the Premier League. West Ham United hosting Manchester City. Now, guys, I can happily predict, I expect Manchester City to drop points. I expect Erling Haaland to struggle with Agard at the centre-back position. West Ham is not a typically easy team to break down. They're going to pack in. They're going to have a counter-attack. And I do believe that the, 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 the crux of the matter will depend on how sharp Jared Bowen is on the day. Because I expect Manchester City to have majority of the ball. I expect them to struggle to break down West Ham United. The key is going to be how sharp are Jared Bowen, Antonio going to be on that day. If they give a performance even slightly resembling what we saw against Chelsea, I expect fully Manchester City to be dropping points. I don't expect our early Haaland goal. I'm actually going to pull him from my fantasy team for this week. And I expect them to drop points. Going on to the Aston Villa versus Crystal Palace game. I think Crystal Palace is going to pull this one out. 1-0. I think they're more organized than what I saw versus Liverpool. Could be because of the opening goal from Dominic Zappos slide that kind of threw the game plan out the window. But for whatever reason, they're quite indisciplined at the back. 
to start the season. They've con- any team with any sort of structure has forced them to con- concede quite a few goals. I expect Olise to get back in the team. So you're going to have that Eze Olise combination, which is quite potent. And I expect them to have Ayu and Edward kind of being on form, on sharp, rested, and ready to rear in to go. Right. So I do expect a, a Crystal Palace, Crystal Palace to go to the villains and cause the upset at one to zero. Newcastle versus Brentford. I expect Newcastle to bounce back on time side and cruise to a 3-0 victory. A double from Alexander Isak. And I also expect Almiron to open his account for the Premier League. Going forward to Sunday's fixtures, right? We have Bournemouth versus Chelsea. Now, I mean, I don't know who can predict Chelsea's season right now. It's, I don't know which Chelsea you're going to get day to day. It's really topsy-turvy. I watched Enzo Fernandez play for Argentina over the break. Brilliant midfielder. Loves to make that late run in the box. You'd think with Caicedo, he would have that license and... But I think the way they set him up, they start him too high up the pitch. Um, there's just something wrong tactically with how Enzo is used at Chelsea. And yeah, he's just a totally different player when I watch him for Argentina. And hence, I don't know, Pochettino seems to be getting it wrong as per usual. However, I do believe they'll grow in the season. I expect Mudrick to get a start because so far, attacking-wise, it hasn't been potent enough. They obviously haven't gotten the results needed. And I expect Chelsea to come through 2-0 on this, in this fixture with, I would say, Jackson getting one and Sterling getting one. A good, a good bet is to put in Sterling. Everton versus Arsenal at Goodison. Arsenal are going to absolutely rape the Toffees. I expect Saka to come back with a bang. Two goals from Saka. I can see two goals from Jesus. And one goal from Martin Odegaard. 5-0 win to the Arsenal against the Evertonian relegated to be soon relegated Toffees. And lastly, rounding out the weekend, we do have your Nottingham Forest versus your Burnley. And... Needless to say, I expect that to be a 1-1 draw. Taiwu Awani to get the single for Nottingham Forest. And Burnley pulling one back. I would expect, I think Vegors is still over there. No, he's at Wolfsburg, no? No, not Vegors. Man, I don't even know who's playing for Burnley right now. I really do need to investigate that. But I do believe it's going to be a 1-1 draw. Um, I believe that Vincent Company, Nottingham versus Burnley, the levels are quite matched up. So his open style of play, playing out from the back, being expansive, will work against Nottingham. And they will be able to score. But I still see them conceding. So I do expect a 1-1 draw for Nottingham Forest. So yeah, that's basically my predictions for the Premier League weekend, week five. Now, just getting into a bit of news as to what it is that's been going on ah manchester united never fails to give us some sort of controversy i know there's a lot being made of jd sancho eric ten Hag. i know there's a lot made of anthony even though i call him shitting and it's I'm, i'm not in any way trying to it's just a little bit of banter I really, my heart really goes out to what he's going through right now. I saw the video of him crying and getting emotional in the videos. Um, the court of public appeal and public judgment is, it's a very hard place to be. And when your life is on display all the time, you know, sometimes we do make mistakes and we never get the chance to recover a lot like a regular person would. Um, I would just like to say, for the people judging Anthony, please get all the particulars before you start slandering him. This is not Mason Greenwood. There are no pieces of evidence. As much as I'm a Liverpool fan, 
I'm also a human being to start with. There is zero evidence that has been put out there to say that he has committed the crimes that he's been accused of. So let's wait to get the facts before we condemn anybody, shall we? Um, but moving on from that until we get evidence and particulars relating to that scenario, what we do have is a situation of Jaden Sancho and Tenard going at it. Now, for the vast majority of Manchester United fans, I've been hearing, oh, that he should have never put out that tweet after the manager berated in the post-match interview. Some people have seen the United stand, Mark Goldbridge, has said that, what did I expect the manager to do? The same loyalty that is expected from the players to the club. The club should be expected to be as loyal to those players. Yes, they get a salary. However, I do believe that if they weren't, and it looks like they've been having issues quite often, then it's far easier to recover from Ten Hag. It's actually more of a, probably would work out better if Ten Hag had said, hey, you know, he's feeling ill alongside McTominay rather than to slate him and just say it's because of his training performance. Because I highly doubt that even if it came out afterwards that Jaden Sancho said that he was lying and he was not in fact um, sick, the, 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 the public persona given off by Ten Hag outside of the fact that he lied would be he protects his players. In this particular scenario, he hasn't protected his players as much as he's thrown him under the bus. Very similarly to Ronaldo, and then he kicks back. And all in all, he seems to be quite the messy manager at this point in time to me. He plays, from my vantage point, from just a pure footballing aspect, I think anybody can, with confidence, say that Anthony has not played well for Manchester United from the second half of last season going into the season. And you can very well say that Jaden Sancho playing in the false nine to start preseason, playing out wide, playing wherever he's asked to be played in the preseason, performing in the pre in the preseason, scoring in the preseason, would wonder why hasn't it warrant at least a looking for him on a start, considering that his direct competition in Anthony for the right hand side is playing so poorly. No one wants to talk about that, however, because you just back the manager and what? Yet still, we can critique Gareth Southgate for picking Harry Maguire for England. But we can't critique Eric Ten Hag for putting Anthony on the field. Seems a little bit hypocritical. Eh? A little bit hypo hypocritical, guys. And I'd just like to say... My two cents is that respect and loyalty goes both ways. And I believe Tenag has screwed the pooch to start with. And it's without winning all Jaden Sancho's right to defend himself because we know about stigmas in football. Once you've gotten a reputation in football, it's very, very hard to shake. And in this world of lies and false narratives and media-driven stories, it's important to have a say in your own future. So for me, shout out to Jaden Sancho for standing up for yourself. Don't make them play that boy shitting in front of you. Get your career back on, uh, back on track, my guy. And that's it from me from the Ball and Breakfast podcast. Look at you, Mike, trying to make me up. That's it from me, Ball and Breakfast podcast. We're out. See you soon after the fixtures, maybe during the fixtures for a live stream. Have a good one. Goal!